The following Lighthouse Talk is distributed by the Augustan Institute, whose mission is to help you understand, live, and share your faith. To order additional copies of this presentation, browse our selection of over 300 inspiring titles in English and Spanish, or receive more information on becoming an Augustan Institute Parish Consultant or Emissary to help answer the Holy Father's call for a new evangelization. Please visit our website at www.augustaninstitute.org forward slash talks or call us toll free at 866-526-2151. Father Robert Spitzer is a Jesuit priest, a highly renowned philosopher, educator, author, and speaker and the former president of Gonzaga University. He is the founder and president of the Magis Center for Reason and Faith, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to developing educational materials on the complementarity of science, philosophy, and Christian faith. Father Spitzer has published numerous books, including New Proofs for the Existence of God and Finding True Happiness. We invite you to download his workbook, Happiness, Suffering, and the Love of God, free of charge, which can be found at www.magiscenter.com. Here now is Father Robert Spitzer. Welcome to our new series, Happiness, Suffering, and the Love of God. I'm your host, Father Robert Spitzer, president of the Magis Center, and our first topic is going to concern happiness and purpose in life. As you'll see in just a moment, happiness is so important that as we define this word, it will in turn determine everything else that we do in our lives. It, it will determine our relationships with others. It will even determine the kinds of philosophical thoughts that we have and even the kinds of careers we choose and what we do even in our churches. So we really want to get that down so we can get the optimal level of happiness and therefore the optimal level of purpose in life. Well, we better begin with our first topic of happiness. I might just start off with a phrase that Aristotle used in his famous work, The Nicomachean Ethics. Right in chapter one, he says, happiness is the one thing you can choose in and for itself. Everything else is chosen for the sake of happiness. Listen to that one more time. Happiness is the one thing you can choose in and for itself. You can't choose anything else in and for itself because you choose everything else for the sake of happiness. This one little word will determine what kinds of relationships you pursue, what kinds of friendships you pursue, what kind of job you pursue, how you're going to carry out that job, how you'll carry out your relationships. And of course, we judge ourselves countless times per day. And when we judge ourselves, we're asking ourselves, are we going somewhere or we're we not going somewhere? The definition of that word happiness, that'll mean all the difference in the world to whether you think you're doing well or not doing well, whether your life is meaningful, whether it's not meaningful, whether you're worth something or whether you're not worth something, what you think is a successful life, what you think is a not so successful life. And of course, we're constantly judging ourselves. I mean, just the definition of that word can lead to depression on the one hand or elation on the other. Boy, if there's one word that we have to get out, I mean, if education is about anything, it's about this word and it's getting this word defined in the optimal possible way for the optimal possible life and optimal possible work relationships, optimal possible friendships and, and even our optimal possible marriage and our optimal possible destiny and our optimal possible eternity. For all intents and purposes, then, this one word, it's determining everything. And so we really need to define it. I'm just going to also make one other observation about this word happiness. And that is what Aristotle noticed is what you make your dominant definition of happiness will become your purpose in life. And it will become your meaning in life. 
And then that purpose in life, that meaning in life, if you live it long enough, it's going to wind up being your identity, who you are, your self-definition. That's part of what we do. We're obviously defining ourselves throughout our lives by our actions and our decisions. So if we have a particular meaning or purpose in life and we're basing our decisions and our actions on that view of happiness, it's going to become who we are. I mean, in our process of, as it were, defining our own essence, we're going to wind up creating ourselves, as it were, in the image of what we consider to be meaning and purpose in life. And all of it dependent on that single word, happiness. Enough about happiness for a moment in general. Now let's just take a look at happiness specifically. If you do a lot of research of psychologists and philosophers and anthropologists and theologians, if you kind of do maybe a survey of 100 of these people throughout the centuries, you're going to notice that there are four kinds of happiness that constantly stand out. Four ways of defining hap. And interestingly enough, those four kinds of happiness can be organized into levels, like level one, level two, level three, and level four. Because we can rank them on the basis of how pervasive, enduring, and deep they are. And what I want to do right now is go through them with you so that you understand each of those definitions because they're very different from each other. And then once we understand, well, what defines happiness and the feeling that accompanies that particular kind of happiness, we'll want to take a look at where is our culture and what's our default drive? And then look at, is there any kind of crisis or problem that's going to drag us down? And if so, how do we resolve it? So let's get to it. You'll notice that all these levels are organized, level one, level two, level three, level four. And the one thing you want to notice as you're going up the levels is every time you move up, you're getting more pervasive, more enduring, and more deep. Pervasive means that the effects are going beyond yourself. So instead of just lodging inside of you some good effect, now all of a sudden the good effect could be going to your family or even further to your community or your organization, your workplace, or even further to the church or the kingdom of God, or even you know into the culture, to the society. So the, the key point is and that, remember, every time you make a move upward, the effects, the good effects of your life are actually moving up to. You're getting more pervasive. Secondly, uh, notice this too. Happiness gets more enduring. It's every time you make a step up, the effects last longer because level one and level two, etc. So the lower you go, you get more immediate gratification. That means you don't have to delay in gratification. You get it satisfied right away. And you also get more intensity, right? So, boy, those gratifications, you get that good physical hit. You get a good ego hit. It's real intense. And you know intensity can be very addictive. So level one doesn't last very long. Level two lasts longer. Level three lasts even longer. Level four, much longer. We'll discuss it. Third thing I I want you to notice is that you also have an increase in depth. So as you move up these levels, you'll notice then that you start employing all of your highest psychological and intellectual powers. Notice the more you go up, the more you have to engage those intellectual powers, the more you have to engage your creativity, the more you're going to have to engage that education you've been getting, the more you're going to have to engage your spiritual capacity, the more you're going to have to engage your capacity to have ideals and principles, the more you're going to have to use your moral reasoning, the more you're going to have to engage your capacity for empathy and love. So notice then, All of your higher powers are going to get more and more and more engaged as you move up the levels of happiness. And you 
don't need any education or nuance whatsoever because on the bottom, it's surface apparent. Kids can notice it as well as adults. In fact, kids notice it better than adults. So it's very obvious, it's immediately gratifying, and it's really intense. What's the problem? It's a trade-off. In order for us to move to what is most pervasive, enduring, and deep, we're going to have to give up some immediate gratification intensity and, and some surface apparentness. We're going to have to get a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more disciplined and a little bit more patient for gratification. And we're going to have to give up some of that intensity. Oh, but the rewards will be great. So what we're talking about here is, is not something that's going to mystify people, but we do need to know the menu. As Plato and Aristotle discovered long ago, we do need to know what makes us tick in our nature, in our highest nature and in our lowest nature, and know the challenges and the discipline that we're going to have to face to move up from level one all the way up to level four. So you might say to yourself, well, well why don't we just leap up to level four? Why isn't it a no-brainer? As we define these things, why not just uh, look at it and say, hey, this is obvious. I want what's more pervasive, enduring, and deep. I should just leap to level four. It, it kind of takes habits. It takes a kind of a, a real effort. In a sense, then, that question is so critical, but it's a, it's a discipline that the academy in the initial years is devoted to it. If you ask Aristotle, well, what's this academy all about? First and foremost, it's defining that term. So you can see what we're talking about in this first episode, which is really a summary of what these great philosophers have talked about, and then later psychologists like Maslow and Erickson and Colbert and anthropologists and Catholic theologians like Max Scheler and Gabriel Marcel and Protestant theologians like Karl Jaspers and Soren Kierkegaard and Jewish philosophers like uh, Abraham Heschel or Martin Buber. Now, having been said, what is level one? Well, you probably guessed it. It's physical material happiness. It's the most surface apparent happiness you can get. Very immediately gratifying, very intense, very surface apparent. Bob Spitzer sees the bowl of linguine with extra garlic, lunges toward the bowl of linguine, wolfs it down, and goes yum. He's immediately satisfied, and then a few moments later suggests another bowl of linguine would be nice. It's that simple. It's physical, it comes from the outside, it stimulates, it gratifies, it's a form of euphoria. Everything seems beautiful with a good bowl of linguine. Other people may define it in terms of cigars. Other people may define it in terms of a good wine. Some people may define it as just simply kinesthetic. Riding in a Mercedes 500 E-Class with the smell of leather upholstery, feeling the German engineering going around the curves. You get it. It's very immediately gratifying. Level two. Level two is ego comparative happiness. And as we'll see in a moment, this is going to play to a very important part of assessing our contemporary cultural crisis. Because I'm going to say this right now, 70% of our culture is very close to ego comparative dominant. Ego, right? That's the Latin word for I. So in other words, this is going to be their primary meaning or purpose in life. So the key thing we want to remember then is that this is going to play a very important role uh, just a little bit down the road uh, in this particular episode. What is it? I feel happy when I shift the locus of control to myself, when somehow I have a comparative advantage. I look better. I have more power. Well, notice then, right off the bat, we're trying to make the locus of control come to us. So we want a comparative advantage. We want ego advantage. So I want to shift the locus of control to me. Now, that being said, well, where do you get this kind of happiness from? Uh, you get it from achievement. And, of course, 
You get it from comparative achievement. I've achieved more than you have. I, it makes me feel really good right at this moment. And, and you can get it from status and popularity, respect and esteem, right? So that whole you know panoply of, of people coming up. Spitzer, you, you have done amazingly well. You play a fantastic chess game. And for all intents and purposes, we really like you. And I respond immediately. This feels so good. Could you tell me a little bit more about myself? And of course, there are no regrets. And, and of course, we get happiness too from power and control. You know, when I'm promoted to the president of Gonzaga, I have to say, even though I would like to be, uh, you know, humble in the image of Christ, uh, I, I might have felt a little ego high at the very moment that occurred. We very naturally feel that this is making us happy. Somehow, we're at the top of our game. This is a very good form of happiness. God has given us this whole awareness of ego and ego gratification because essentially, it is good. Is there anything wrong with esteem and admiration? No, actually, if you have esteem and admiration, then you're going to have credibility. And if you have credibility, then doors are going to open. And if doors open, you're going to be able to do some really good things. And, and is there anything wrong with power and control? I mean, it does make me feel happy, but is there anything intrinsically wrong with it? No, there's nothing wrong with power and control. I mean, we need power and control in order to do some good for the world or to do some good for the kingdom of God. So you can see that there's nothing wrong. Is there anything wrong with intelligence and education? I hope not. I've given my whole life over to it. And, and frankly, is, is there anything wrong with winning? No, I don't want to cower before people who challenge me. So we want people to be high achieving and to have status and respect so that they can do things, to have power and control so they can do things, uh, to develop their intelligence and, and their education. So why do I mention that there's a cultural crisis associated with this? The reason is because we can start believing that it's the only thing that makes our life worth living. Instead of looking at our intelligence as something which is going to be very useful to making a positive difference to my family or to the organization or to my culture, to the church or the kingdom of God, instead of looking at it that way, I look at my intelligence as an end in itself. It's just sufficient for me to be smarter than you and to be smarter than all of you. And when it starts to get that way, or status becomes an end in itself. And of course, you know what that can do to make you a neurotic. And of course, you know what begins to happen when power and control become an end in itself. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, if it's an end in itself. But if it's being utilized for a good, then not. You get the point. Winning becomes an end in itself. It can also just drive everyone around us mad. Okay, now you're going to see a, this idea of the comparison game. And what I want to do is just quickly outline uh, for you what's likely to happen not only when we, but when our children or when our parents, when any of us, makes level two. Remember, level two is good. It's meant to be good. It's given to us by God. We should be high achieved. We should be educated and intelligent. We should have some status to do some good. We should have some power and control to do some good. We should have some winning in our lives and instilling confidence. All these things are goods. What's the problem? It's when it becomes an end in itself. And of course, when that occurs, the one thing we want to do is we want to make sure that that's what we really want to occur because here are the consequences. There are three possible consequences for the comparison game. Consequence. Number one, I'm going to move myself up to defining happiness in a dominant way as level two. And then once I've done that, once I've said this is the only thing that matters, I'm going to treat Level two happiness has an end in itself. Then, of course, my entire mentality starts separating out into the world into win, lose, draw, 
right? Or better than, worse than, about equal. So one of these paradigms is going to be operative. So notice then that I'm going to be going around going, who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who got more power? Who's got less power? Who's got more stats? Who's got less stats? Who's smarter? Who's less smart? Who's winning? Who's with disdainful outlook losing? Because of course, all these things have now become an end in themselves. And so we're constantly looking back and forth. Now watch what happens. Let's start with our poor losers, the ones who are worse than, if I can put it that way. You can pretty much see that these people are really going to feel the brunt of inferiority. They're going to think that they're being judged. They're going to feel like their lives are inferior. They're going to feel like they're worth less than the people around them, that they've been dealt a bad hand by God if they have faith. You get the point. Inferiority feelings are not fun. The feeling of being judged negatively is not, I don't have to tell you, it's not happiness. And furthermore, you're going to feel jealousy, right? I mean, if somebody else is coming along and they just get it so much faster and they seem so much smarter and they seem this and they seem that and they have every advantage in the world and you're just looking at all of them, you're not going to like them that much. And if it's at all possible, what you'd really like to do is find some kind of a flaw, anything at all. Because then you can point it out and notice that it feels oh so good. But jealousy always winds up being destructive. You don't have to read Shakespeare to figure it out. It's common sense. But more than that, all these things pile up on us. The inferiorities, the jealousies, the feelings of being judged. And of course, what winds up happening? We start becoming depressed. We really don't think our lives amount to anything. And when that happens, when you feel like your life is meaningless or comparatively meaningless, when you begin to feel like, you know, you're surrounded by people who are far superior and you have just lapsed into inconsequence that no one respects you, I, I have to tell you, you are going to get irresolvably depressed. This is not happy. Whatever you do, whatever you do, don't be a loser if the only thing that matters in life is level two. If that's the way you've defined meaning in life, don't lose. Okay, now, so you're just about equal with everybody else in the who's achieving more, who's achieving less, etc. I don't have to tell you what's going to happen now. The key thing, of course, is you're going to have to protect that uh, edge, even if you're just holding your own. You're going to have to make sure that you're staying with it because at least you've got a modicum of respect. At least, you know, you're, you, you can kind of hold your own amidst a good middle-ranked group. But notice what begins to happen in your life. That fear, that fear of loss of esteem, that fear of being exposed, that fear when you sit down to take an examination, that fear that, you know, somehow my intelligence will be revealed to be less than adequate, that fear of any kind of an athletic event. Believe me, I've certainly experienced that since everyone in the audience is a better athlete than me. But you get the point. The point is, you get this fear of loss of esteem. If something happens, if I make a mistake, I mean, we sweat bullets at night, if I don't pass this exam, whatever it is, right, you sweat bullets at night because you, you can't stand the thought that you might not get the promotion, that something's going to happen to you which is going to undercut your life. Now, some of that is perfectly natural, but when you define level two as the most important thing that will ever happen to you, it then just goes beyond the natural. And, of course, it becomes almost a neurotic kind of fear, a debilitating kind of fear enough said. Uh, secondly, you get another thing that, that starts going on, and that is you got to protect yourself. You have to be really political, right? You know, you got to make sure your territory is protected. So you're going to have to make sure no one shares your glory and your limelight. You're going to have to figure ways of pushing them 
out to the periphery. And furthermore, you're going to have to turn your whole life into a kind of a political arena and, and arrange it so that you can maintain the status you have and maintain the respectability that you have in light of these level two definitions. And then thirdly, if all of that is going on, between the fear on the one hand and all of the politics on the other, you're, you're driving people around you absolutely crazy. Done. Let's go up to the winners. Looks like they have the optimal possible advantage. The winner is in the driver's seat. Really? I don't think so, because the winner has to stay a winner. So whatever you do as a winner, don't plateau. Because if you do plateau and you can't go any further as a winner, then you'll go and feel the same emotions as a person who is drawing and, of course, the person who is, is losing. So you don't plateau. I mean, the second thing you begin to feel is when you're a winner, you kind of have to maintain divine status for yourself at all times. Don't make a mistake. Don't mispronounce the word spectroscopy as spectroscopy in a lecture. And then someone walks up to you and goes, you know, Spitzer, that word spectroscopy, you pronounced it spectroscopy three times. And now everybody believes you're a consummate idiot. And then you believe them. And then when you go home, you play that tape a thousand times before you go to bed. And then you have suicidal feelings over the mispronunciation of a word. Suicidal feelings over the mispronunciation of a word. I mean, it's an insane life. Any little mistake is just devastating. It has reverberations and, and echoes you know, th throughout your whole conscious mind. Don't plateau. Don't make mistakes. And by the way, you're going to find yourself in contempt too. You're going to get addicted to adulation. Been there, done. The key thing with adulation is real simple, and that is that you're going to have addictions to, Spitzer, you, you are so good, and your life is so much more meaningful than the rest of us. We really love you, and we really love to hang around. And then one day, people get self-respect, and they stop giving you that adulation. You know what I'm saying? And when they do stop giving you that adulation, what happens? You grow absolutely resentful. And when you grow resentful, you want to pay people back. You little inferior, how come you're not kissing up the way you used to? What do you think you are, my equal? Uh, you're going to have to pay. Done it, been there, done that. My point is, this is not a happy life because every contemptuous person is lonely. No one can stand to be around them except their mothers. You've got loneliness, you've got contemptuousness, which is not a good stand anyway in and of itself. So the point that we want to make in, when we talk about this thing called the comparison game is this, that if level two happiness becomes the only thing that will make my life worth living, if level two happiness is treated as an end in itself, then something starts going awry. Right? We begin to neurotically ask ourselves, who's achieving less? Who's got more power? Who's got less power? Who's smarter? Who's less smart? And I'm going to make sure, even if the other guy is smarter, that I look smarter by hook or by crook. Because not only do we become neurotic about it, we have to have it. It's like our whole identity, our whole psychological well-being, as we'll talk about, is just ripped out of us. It turns a very, very good thing, this level two happiness, treat it as an end in itself and the only thing that will make life worth living into a very bad thing. It makes us unhappy, it makes the people around us unhappy, and it destroys the legacy that we're going to leave for the world, not to mention our ethics. No one wins the comparison game. No one wins the level two dominance game. It becomes not only our individual neurosis, unhappiness, and meaninglessness in life. It literally becomes our cultural neurosis. But we better get to level three. Level three is a little bit more pervasive, enduring, and deep, but a little more delayed gratification, 
It requires a little more giving up of intensity and a little bit more uh, training of the mind, a little bit more nuance, a little bit more education to, to get to it. But at the end of the day, when you do, it's truly worth it. And of course, uh, this third level of happiness, let's call it ego out or contributive happiness and empathetic happiness. So here, the focus is no longer on who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's got more power or more status or more intelligence, who's got less power, status, and intelligence, etc. The question now changes completely because we have a third driver within us. And that third driver is to want to make the most out of our lives. We want our lives to be as significant as possible. We do not want to go through our entire lives thinking to ourselves, you know, I didn't do anything for anybody. I didn't make any difference. My life makes no difference. Every one of us has scripted into us an intense drive and desire to leave some kind of a positive legacy in the world. Not just after I die, but to leave a legacy in the world as I'm living, to influence real people, to influence real institutions, to influence the church, to influence the kingdom of God. We want to make an optimal positive difference in the world. That's, that's how we're built. But remember, as I said before, level two is the default drive. That's where we'll go if we don't make any choices. Now we get to level three, and we're going to have to make a choice to get there. And we see that what we want to do is make an optimal positive difference to people beyond ourselves. I think, you know, you can look at it from the opposite way around. So you can say, hey, what would happen if you didn't have that kind of contributive meaning in your life, that you didn't have anything that really made a difference or your life made a difference. I mean, what if you got to 80 years old and went, hmm, what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? And you had to say at the end of the day, maybe the rock did more for the world than I did. You would be in incipient despair. No one no one could stand to think that they not only didn't have any value, that they contributed nothing, but that they were a negative contributor, that they kind of sucked the world dry. They had a negative legacy. That's despair because we're just built to want to make a difference. We've got all these